Here <laughs> In this episode of the Documentary Review Podcast, Jonathan and I hire special guest host Greg to investigate why we don't have more podcast listeners, but he quickly turns on us and, and reveals that it's because we killed them all. As we discuss the 2015 documentary, Soaked in Bleach. Welcome to the podcast. I'm PT. And I'm Jonathan. And I'm Greg. Glad Yay. Yay. Welcome, guest <laughs> host, Greg. I think uh, it's pretty, it's pretty uh, clear in my mind that a three-person podcast, I think, is almost always better than a two-person podcast. I feel like because you know when when you got time to like play off each other, plus one of you can one of you can kind of because when there's two of you, if one of you is thinking about their next point they're going to say and not really paying attention to the first guy, it's just you know three people you got a good good play so. I hope to God this podcast doesn't prove me wrong. <laughs> and <laughs> plus, you always have to worry about cutting people off and stuff like that too with three people. It's true. It's true. Cool. Um, so happy holidays, guys! I'm glad it's officially the holiday season here. I, uh, I'm glad we're we're all with it. Um, we survived uh, campus knocked. Campus knocked. That's I believe is the Eastern European holiday where. Uh, where uh, the evil version of of Santa Claus comes and like punishes the bad children. <laughs> is that Krampus? Yeah, Krampus knocked. I think is the. Oh really? Because the they... night it's Krampus's night. Um, but they yeah, but it's kind of cool. Movie cause... coming out about Krampus. Yeah, yeah, yeah doesn't it come? Like... I think it comes out this Friday. I think so. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But I uh, but I'm kind of jealous of the holiday because like they kind of like get an extra Halloween. It's like a Halloween type holiday. Ooh. So, Anyway, so aside from like the Christmas, the your, your Christmas and your Hanukkahs in this holiday season, you guys got any favorite holidays in this December? Any holidays you want to shout out? <laughs> December. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think I think the Christmas is the big one we do around my household. I don't know if anyone else has heard of it. It's this whole thing where you give each other presents and there's a tree. I don't know. It's... Mm-hmm. Greg, you got any, yeah, any good holidays? Any... We don't have any unusual family holidays. No, I mean Christmas Eve has always been a big thing in the Johnson family. So, do you guys do uh, Christmas Eve presents or Christmas morning presents? Well, with the, my kids, we do Christmas Day presents, but with the rest of the family, we kind of do Christmas Eve presents. Gotcha. Hot take, hot take on the presents, present situation there. <laughs> um, so speaking of holidays, <laughs> speaking of holidays, holy cow! Uh, this this. This documentary really kind of brought out the holiday spirit. It was really one of those, one of those <laughs> festivals that you, you, you really want to watch at this time of year. Um, so, Greg, I don't know if you're aware, but Jonathan is known throughout the podcasting world for his 30-second summaries of documentaries. They're, they're known, they're loved. The guys from Film Spotting are like, oh, I wish we could give summaries like that. All the other big movie podcasts. So Jonathan, don't let us down. What is Soaked in Bleach all about? All right, uh, Soaked in Bleach is a 2015 documentary that chronicles the death of Kurt Cobain through the eyes of Tom Garrett, a private investigator that was hired by Courtney Love, uh, and it really dives into, you know, you can you can look at it as one of two things, either a conspiracy theorist kind of going off the deep end or, you know, somebody who uh, is going to bring you home, but it really it's a, a very lopsided documentary. Uh, solely one point of view. So if you don't agree with it, you're probably not going to like this documentary. If you dive in, you know, on board with them, you're probably going to love it. So it's a really a polarizing documentary, as far as viewers are going to go. So that's kind of nice. so simple. All right, cool. Uh, did you like it? Give us the upper thumbs up or thumbs down. Give this one a thumbs down. I did not like mm. it. Okay. Greg, uh, thumbs up or thumbs down for you? Well. Like I found it extremely disturbing, but I did like it. I I did like the documentary. I thought it was a good story to be told, and I I found it extremely interesting. Okay, thumbs up from Greg. We got the oh man, man, I'm just excited. Gonna, you are, and I'm very, I'm very borderline on this. Um, I think, I think overall, I'm gonna give it a thumbs down, I guess. But here's so here's here's my. Ooh. Well, before before we get into that whole, but I am pretty borderline on it. I, like, there's a lot I like about it. But let me ask you guys this before we get into like the whole discussion of the documentary. Um, so, as Jonathan said, it's about this private investigator. 
so like okay, so at the beginning he's hired by Courtney Love right to find Kurt Cobain, her missing husband. But then he just like hangs out. He's just like <laughs> after Kurt Cobain dies, right. he's just like he's still there, and he's not only that, but he's like. Listen, Cordy, you're gonna <laughs> answer my questions, and instead of just be like, "Um, no, get out of here," I no longer want you to be employed by me. She's like, "Oh my God, all right, I guess I gotta answer your questions." Babe. Yeah, I, I thought about it a ton I of times too. That like, like that kind of like almost made her seem even like more innocent to me because she could have done that at any time. Been like, "Uh, yeah, get out of here, dude. I'm not. You're not even under my employee anymore. There's no point to you. You're not like an official." or anything, you're just a citizen running around. She could have been like, get out of my house, or stop calling me. But she was just like, oh, whatever, hey, Tom. How's it going, buddy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought of that, too. Like, even if... I would have been like, get, get the heck out of here. What are you doing? Yeah, like... I kinda, like it, was kinda, it was kind of my understanding why Tom continued the investigation, was I think he was embarrassed because he didn't find the body. I think, I think he was almost embarrassed that the body was there for Dude. a couple of days. Yeah. And so I, I think he truly felt that the wall was pulled over his eyes, and that's why he continued the investigation. Well, I got to say one thing, yeah. They, and they brush, they do like blow over that point in the documentary where they're like, they're like, gee, Tom, some people make fun of you because for four days you were at the house right next to the body, and you're a private investigator and you couldn't find it. And they were like, well, you know, it's kind of hard to see that in the dark. I was like, no, that's. They're like, we're looking for something. Where could it be? We've got the house and the garage. What could we? Where could it possibly be? We checked the house. Guess we can't find it. I was like, why? They, why didn't you look in the garage? Even if you looked in the bottom part of the garage and been like, we searched all the bottom part of the garage, but I didn't know there was an upstairs. That would have made a little more sense. But it's like, dude, well, check the garage. This, this 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 part this part was actually kind of confusing for me, and I did watch the second time, and it appeared in the recreation that they parked in front of the house. They didn't park like in the garage. Uh, in the driveway, so yeah, I, he just went into the house, and so he didn't even know that garage was there, or that they called it the green room, or whatever. He had no idea yeah, that building was even part of their property. Yeah, yeah. that's kind of what I thought too. That it was like kind of, kind of. I didn't, I didn't think it was even the garage. I thought it was like a separate building off no, back, like behind the house. Yeah, I'm pretty curious. And again, this is one of many points I'd be a little curious about. I got the impression, like from like the crime scene photos and stuff like that, that it was like the the greenhouse was the the room on top of the garage. Like, it looked like... Because in one shot, there was, like, actual garage doors on that building. So, like, underneath yeah, the garage... Yeah, that's exactly what it looked and, like. Yep, and then on top, it just had, that like, an attic that had been converted into, like, greenhouse or, or whatever, storage unit, whatever you want to say, call it. But again, it, it, it seemed like... Yeah, he should have been... Especially because he wasn't necessarily looking at, on some of his trips for Kurt. He was like, we want to find the shotgun. And, it, like, if somebody asked me, like... You know, let's go look for the shotgun. I'd be like, well, let's check the garage. I mean, look through the house first, and the garage seems like a pretty logical place to put, you know, a shotgun or something like that. Um, but anyway, yeah, that minor point, but I still thought, like, yeah, what the hell? I mean, why didn't this guy check the other building? Yeah, the, I do like uh, that. That makes sense, though, Greg. I like your point about that. He was, he was embarrassed about that. I hadn't thought of that. Um, so I, yeah. so that's, that's, that's kind of my assumption of why he continued this the whole story. I mean, because quite honestly, because you're, you're right, because once he was hired to do a job and then once they found he was dead, I mean, it was like his job's over. Why, why did he keep going? Yeah, right, but why did, why, did, why did Cordy stop him? Like, at one point, when, towards the end, when he was, like, interviewing that one Dylan dude, and he was like, yeah, no, i got to ask him, like, some super important questions right now. And I was, like, why, why did yeah. they be like, no, uh, get out of here, yeah. buddy. He, here's the other thing that, that killed me about this that just made me, like, think that Tom Garrett is kind of an idiot. He's just like, first he's like, he's like, yeah, Courtney Love was acting really suspicious from the beginning. She was acting really odd. And then the next sentence he's like, yeah, she was in a room doing drugs. She was either on drugs or doing drugs every time I saw her. It's like, yeah, yeah, she she was acting a little odd because she was super high. She's a drug addict. Yeah, that makes sense. And like when that other Dylan dude comes, he's like, oh, why did he go upstairs to get coached by Courtney? He'd be like, a heroin junkie came over to a place that there's heroin, and the first thing he did was shoot up. Like, yeah, I don't think he was trying to avoid you as much as he was a heroin junkie around heroin. Uh, so, yeah, there's, and he, he just didn't seem to understand that at all. Like, these people are drug addicts. <laughs> they don't quite operate on, you know, a normal, sane, sober kind of plane. Yeah, um, so... Well, first of all, what a weird, like, circumstance that, like, 
they, like Courtney Love just called that guy out of the yellow pages, and now apparently that's just that. I don't know if that's that dude's life or what, but it kind of seemed like that. Seems like that's, that's like all he does. Deal is like uh, doing that. Um, so for me, like well, they, the, they the, said, the, they've been filming this movie for the past eight years. They said right, oh, but really? this isn't. Yeah, so they've been doing this this documentary for the past eight years. But he's had his like online thing, you know, more or less since Kurt died, and then uh, they did another documentary called, uh, I think Courtney and Kurt or Kurt and Courtney or something like that. Which was made yeah. with him essentially is a, a huge piece of that one as well. So he's he's really spent at least a good chunk of his professional career since that on this one case. Okay, uh, well, well, let's take this guy out of the situation and we can actually talk about the true facts that we do know about it. Nice, and that is like, like how much heroin was in Kurt Cobain when he was di- when he died. Br- okay, so. I like where your head's at, because here, here's one of the reasons I hated the documentary, and I, I'm going to go <laughs> play, but I, I, didn't, I did not like it. I hated it, but uh, for, okay. for a whole bunch of reasons, one of which was, like, if they would have been spotting out, like, facts or timelines or said, like, this person could have done it or give me some theories to work with over the course of this huge documentary, I, I would have been way more interested, whether I agreed or not, but at least give me something to think about. They only threw out two facts during the whole documentary that that set, that kind of suggested maybe it wasn't a suicide. One was the heroin, that he had a lot of heroin in his system, and maybe, you know, was that, could he potentially have injected that much heroin and used the shotgun? And the other fact was the shell casing was, you know, essentially not where it should have been. It should have ejected to the other side, not the side that it landed on. Those are the only two pieces of evidence that he, he throws out in this, you know, hour and a half documentary. Um, so that that kind of pissed me off to begin with. It was like, oh, your whole thing is that this is like a big conspiracy murder thing. I mean, like, did did he prove that Courtney Love is, you know, a, a whacked out junkie? Yeah, I think they brought some. And did they prove that they could have done a much more thorough job in the investigation? Yeah, I think they 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 could have at least waited until the toxicology report came back before declaring a suicide. Well, but they, anyway, if you look at yeah, they show the report on there it's just that the same date is the date same they found day, the body, yeah. they declared this yeah, they declared a suicide the same exact day. Yeah, yeah, it was so like, no, I I truly I truly think that the whole idea behind this movie was just to say, "Hey, we need to go back and look at this." And that's all it was about. I mean, it was definitely cuz he had a lot of like circumstantial evidence, of course, you know, about Courtney Love and everything, but like I mean, it was just basically, like, hey, look, there's a lot of hinky things going on here. Let's check this out. Right. And I, I did check out the, the heroin thing a little bit, which I, went total tangent, but, like, I wish there was more studies and, and actual time spent <laughs> dedicated to, to, like, the actual science of narcotics, which there's virtually none. You know, like, Harvard should no, have a right, study yeah, on it, but there's not. And obviously, anyway, whole different topic. And like all other drugs, they didn't have much information on intravenous heroin use, you know, illicit heroin. Um, but oddly enough, the, where I found all the information, or the place I could actually find information where I'm like, essentially like junkie help, like blogs, if you will, or whatever, where people came together talking about like heroin issues. Yeah. And I was right, shocked. Now you, got, now you got that in your search history. Right, thing. I know, and I, I thought of that too. I was like, oh, geez, the kids are going to pull up. Yeah, like, say it's good. Oh, yeah, anyway, but like, a lot of them, it, like tons of them, have definitely done way more heroin, like the milliliters or whatever of heroin than than Kurt Cobain did when he died. So it definitely wouldn't necessarily kill you because there are a lot of people that like you know were like, yeah, I did X amount, and it was a lot more than that, you know, like because it was like whatever, 0.275, and some people were like, yeah, they'd done up to five, whoever 0.5. So it was, you know, almost twice as much as Kurt Cobain did and lived, and they did say they were like you know, whacked out of their minds when they did that. And so, I mean, like, one, I, I don't think that's necessarily, like, they say, like, three times a lethal dose for, like, the most, you know, horror, you know, like, habitual user. And again, I, I from my research, that's not the case. They, they, they say it's, like, they say it's 70 times the limit for a regular person, not a habitual user. Use it, right, like seventy right. times, right. and they said it. Yeah, and they pull out that crazy graphic, and but they and they say it's three times the lethal amount for a habitual user. Yeah, and from what I could actually find from habitual users is that's that's not the case. 
that you can actually do that much heroin and survive um, and continue to do so. And I would think Kurt Cobain had to be up there on the upper echelon of, of regular heroin users. Like, especially when the guy, the one guy is like, yeah, Kurt doesn't like staying in fancy hotels. He stays in crappy ones, and we shoot up for three weeks straight. <laughs> I was like, wow, that's a lot of shooting up. Um, but you know what I mean? Like, I, it's, but, but again, I wish I had, had more than junkie blogs, essentially, to go off of on that fact. I wish Harvard had a case study that said, you know, we track we track the progression of heroin use among addicts, and here's what actually is, and here's what, you know, could this actually kill you or not? Um, right. And, and more importantly, to this point, could you shoot that up, and would you have a five-minute window before you were a vegetable, or is it, you know, 15 seconds? Like, you'd have to inject that, and, like, 15 seconds later, you're all just, like, you know, slouched down on a couch, or does it take five minutes? Because there's your answer, you know, I mean, there's a big part of it, and I, I couldn't find an answer to that question. All right, so uh, so, so, if you're listening to this, tweet your thoughts on that matter with hashtag <laughs> Junkie Blog. I think hashtag Junkie Blog. <laughs> great hashtag to get going. Um, yeah, I, I, I did not do even the research you did, so <laughs> no idea. But, um, like, yeah, for me, so, like, even aside from, like, we can get back to the other evidence, the shotgun and stuff in a second. Um, but for me, like, the whole what I liked and didn't like, I'll tell you what I liked and didn't like about the documentary. So what I liked is I think it did present some interesting stuff that made that made me think like, hey man, maybe they should look into this a little more. But what they did badly was make a movie. I thought they were not very good uh, very good filmmakers. You know what I mean? Like the Agreed. This like, is this is yeah, I, I we had this conversation before we started the podcast. So I was like, <laughs> are we talking about the content or just like the actual how they did it? Both. <laughs> both. Yeah, yeah. Like, the, like everything from the, even from the opening, like the opening scene, like you could see what they were trying to do with that thing where like they broke into Kurt's house. You could see they're like trying to set up like a dramatic moment that would like, you know, later you'd find out what was. But man, it was so badly done. And then like all just all the reenactments were just yeah, the, <laughs> so weird, so so dumb. Right, the reenactments were horrible. And then like another like pet peeve for me that really pissed me off every time they did it. <laughs> Was when they they take like the auto recording, like where this guy actually recorded the stuff, and they'd throw in like four lines of it, and they'd have the actors doing the reenactment, like talking over those lines, and then they would stop that recording, and go on for a while, and it was like, okay, I w if they would have at the beginning said no reenactment dialogue or like every single word of dialogue in the reenactment came from these recordings or whatever were transcribed from the recordings. I'd be like, great, now I'm just listening to, you know, a clearer version of those recordings. But they could have said anything and tricked the whole audience, which really pissed me off. It was like, oh, we're going to start from a line of actual dialogue, then we're going to fill it with whatever we want in our reenactment scenes, and it's going to seem really believable because we cut from something that was real into a script. And it was like, ah, yeah. it, it, you either need clarify that or you guys didn't clarify it because you're doing exactly what I am worried you're doing. That was confusing. I agree. That was very confusing. But, I mean, I liked how they used the actual original recordings, but like again, yeah. like you said, they switched over and it was like, I hope they just switched over just because you couldn't understand it on the, on the original recordings. <laughs> or whatever. Right. I have a feeling that's not the case. I hope I'm wrong, but I have a feeling that they were just like, well, that part was real, and now we're gonna now we're gonna fill in the blanks with what we want, but it's gonna seem really real because we did it this way. So I yeah, wonder, that really... like that that that'd be like that's a fine line there they're walking. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I've I've seen this I documentary. If it's not on the re... I've I've seen this documentary even described some places as a docudrama, like like they don't want to like necessarily call it a full documentary because because of those scenes. I can right. see that. Yeah, there was such a huge cast to this documentary that I'm like, whoa, how much of a cast can you have before it's not a documentary anymore? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, I assume it's because they couldn't get any of the original players to actually be in it besides <laughs> Tom Grant. Yeah. I would have yeah. liked to hear no, that conversation no. with Courtney. Could you come and reenact some of these phone calls? That would be no. sweet. There's where you're wrong. There is an actor that played Tom Carrot in there, and he's a cast member. <laughs> well, I know, but he's in it too. He's I know, also in it. I know what you mean, but I just thought that was funny. It was like, even that guy has a cast, 
you know, somebody acting like him. But, um, and I recognize that actor. He's been in some stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so, so uh, yeah, uh, yeah, just the filmmaking really got to me. And, like, the, it was very, I don't know, I, I couldn't figure out if I was dumb or, just, or this movie was, like, there were so many things in the timeline where it's just like, wait, what? Where, yeah. where are we now? What's What's happening? That was another huge pet peeve of mine. Was like, because first they that very opening scene, it's like the day before, and they never even say the day before the body was discovered or the day. Which eventually you're like, oh, okay, that's their their before their 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 check mark in the timeline is the discovery of his body. But it takes you a while to figure that out because the first time you're just like the day before, so the day before he died, the day before what happened. I don't know. And uh, as it turns out, it was the day before the body was discovered. And they work it all out of order for the timeline, which really pissed me off because it's like, if you're going to try and make a crime drama out of this, show the stuff you actually knew when it would happen. Show this, the timeline of Tom in order so I can put these pieces together on top of each other and, and try and see what's going on. Like, what are they trying to prove? You know, who who was theoretically the killer? But they didn't. They just made it really confusing and threw it out of order, and that, that pissed me off too. But I have, I have a moment where this documentary... Like, where I, because I started off watching it and I was like, ooh, you know, did Kurt Cobain, you know, I was open to the idea that there was something going on here. But uh, my big moment that they were like, and which happens pretty early on, is they're like, yeah, so Kurt Cobain wasn't even suicidal. That's just some weird, you know, mythology that was based around him because his lyrics were kind of crappy. And then they cut to like four interviews. And he's like, "Yeah, I'm I'm doing really good. I'm doing great. You know, I'm Kurt Cobain. I'm happy. This is super cool. You know, They're like, see, look, that guy was super cool. They here's a, here's a childhood friend that he had, and that guy's like, yeah, Kurt wasn't suicidal. He was doing really good. And then they're like, yeah, I mean, like, sure, he just overdosed, whether it be on accident or purpose. Uh, he's a massive heroin junkie. He just checked out of rehab. He's getting a divorce. And then, like, if you know anything about Kurt Cobain, like, if you've seen any of like, they just released all his journals and all that stuff. That guy was like a, a, a friggin' mess. Like from his own journals he was suicidal from like a very young age and had thought a lot about suicide and like really had a horrific life and or you know, was was a really depressed suicidal kind of dude. And when they just blow that off, they're just like, Oh Kurt's a super happy dude. I mean yeah, he just got out of rehab and he's getting a divorce and he's a heroin junkie, but he's super good. Like, okay. <laughs> no, <laughs> That part didn't didn't bother me as much. I, I like I guess I saw I could see that from their perspective that like like I didn't read it as like no he's definitely very happy but I I could I could see the perspective of hey this is like a maybe a little bit overblown that he's suicidal because like like I know there's like especially just the taking stuff from his lyrics and all and all this stuff um, I, I hate that when people take take art like super literally and and wanna interpret stuff about the artist from it and uh. Yeah, like I'm not saying he wasn't suicidal. I don't know if he was or not, but but uh, but I could see what what they were getting at. And that didn't bother me at all. I I could see that too. If and you know if I didn't know anything about Kurt Cobain other than this documentary, I probably would have been like, oh yeah, well he looks really happy and he says he's happy in there. But like, you know, if you go back through that guy, I mean, he's he had, you know, whatever. Like he always refers to like how shitty his childhood was and like how he hated his stepfather and how he was estranged from his mother and like. You know what I mean? You can't just blow that off, and they totally did. And it just it just pissed me off right there. I was like, oh, okay, so basically you're just gonna like bend reality to the point where you're like, see, look at, it. he's fine. So there's no way right. that. Well, I, yeah, but I don't, I don't know. I, th- I think it is worth. It, it is an interesting point that like just because someone is like, I think because I think Kurt Cobain was very much like manic depressive. Is I don't know if he was like clinically manic depressive, but he would go through like very very high, like super excited and happy about everything periods and very low periods. And I think it's dangerous to be like when someone like that, you know, like well, of course, they're sure, feel them sure. Closer. And I and I think they I think they really played off of that too. If they would and if they would have said, "Hey, he's manic," and that doesn't necessarily mean he's suicidal, I would have been like, "Okay, good point." But they weren't. They were just like, obviously, they knew at least that much that he was at least manic, and they were like, "Okay, here's the super high moments. We got some of those on tape. We're gonna play those." 40 seconds of his life where he's in his highest points and saying like, yeah, I'm super happy, where you know, again, he's at least manic, if not suicidal. And there, and instead of being like, you know, hey, he's manic, he had no, su- no you know, real history, and present like a real case to me. Don't just be like, we're going to take a couple sound bites and then be like, nope, not at all, just that goes out the window. And that just, 
that just made me feel like they're trying to look at me like I'm an idiot and I've never heard of this guy and it, it pissed me off at that point. So fair enough, fair enough. Yeah. Um, all right, so let's move on to any any, any of the other evidence, Greg, that you want to call out as like that you thought was interesting or left out at you in particular. Um, I mean, the the one thing, and this is funny, like my wife and I, we actually. I don't know, we watched like 48 hours and stuff like that, like crime dramas and like real crime and stuff like that. Nice. And the one thing that really left out of me <laughs> about this was that if the roles were reversed, if this was a woman that was dead and, and the man was the one saying these things, I can almost guarantee the cops would have been looking at him for murdering her. Interesting point. Like men of, I, I, like from what they, all the circumstances, like because she had massive motive. If they truly were going through a divorce, that's the one thing that she really had was crazy. There's crazy motive for her to do this, and so a lot of times that's all cops need, and they'll take that and run with it. So, so I mean, like I just like, again, like, like I just there's again, I just all I, all I think that this movie was really trying to point out. What I really think is there should have been much more of an investigation into this, and to me, it seems like there's plenty, there's plenty there for the investigation to continue. Yeah, yeah. And that's 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 where I thought the movie really shined, and, and why I didn't want to give it a full, full, full hearted uh, thumbs down is just that. Yeah, I think I, I I definitely agree with that, and I think that where the movie really shined is when they like brought in the, the Seattle, the chief of police from Seattle, and brought in like. Forensics experts and stuff like that. That was interesting. Yeah, the, friend, was the awesome handwriting stuff. experts. Yeah, that, that was all interesting. The linguist yeah. experts and stuff. Give me an yeah, hour. Yeah, the, that. yeah the, suicide note, the suicide note was actually kind of a big thing, too, they talk about in the movie as well. Right. And again, that's, yeah. that's another one of the things that, that Tom Grant missed, apparently, that because it, it was a, in that bed and he said he looked through the bed and he didn't find it. Yeah. You know? Yeah, the the second suicide note or the second letter, right? Because I mean, like, the actual suicide note. Yeah, the actual letter. No, the actual. There's only one. Right, no, but the one that he didn't find was that it wasn't under her bed. It was actually in the greenhouse or whatever. It was. It had the pen through it and was stuck in the flower pot in the greenhouse. The co- the okay, note yeah. the other the note Courtney was talking about that was under the pillows where they had that conversation. He's like, I looked under the pillows, and she's like, Well, it was under oh, the yeah, pillows. Yeah, okay. That was just like a second note or whatever. Um, they never tell you okay. what was in it. But anyway, yeah, and again, like the, the suicide note, I'm curious about. And like one thing like that makes me, and again, if you knew you know, Kurt Cobain and it had like access to all his writings and stuff like this, again, you could theoretically fake it. But like, because um, at first glance, the suicide note looked a little ridiculous because those last four lines are all like in a different font size and written differently yeah. than the rest of the compressed note. But like, if you've got a minute, watch uh, Montage of Heck, which is super depressing, so if you want to be really depressed and watch a, a, you know, a crazy documentary thing, check it out. But the one, on thing that, yeah, the one thing they do have is uh, all his journals, like all his journal notes and like, uh, like tons of like, just re- like script and things that he's written and, and that stuff is actually really interesting. But uh, but like the format that he writes in, and again, if you had access to all those journals, you could copy it. But the format he writes in is very much the style of that suicide note, where like you'll he'll have like super compressed tight writing, and then like graphics, like little like drawings and arts, and then like the the lettering will ch- totally change and get big and small and stuff like that. So I think that would have that note would have seemed more like fake to me. If I hadn't seen that other stuff, and I, and I don't mean to say, and again, like they never. Well, the thing was, they never really talked about like the size of the writing. Like, was, like that stood out to me like drastically. Like when I first just looked at it, right, um, right. The size totally. of the writing is totally different. But what they talked about was just the way, like the whole the whole rest of the note, like talked like a, it, it felt like a certain way, and then at the end, it was just totally different. Yeah, it was, like just and, it, and, it, and that was like a. I forget what the, the the expert they talked about. It was like a linguist of some sort. So, I mean, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, right. I did. Did you guys go and read the note? It's no, I didn't. Okay. No, I did not read I, the note. I did. <laughs> nice, man, job. Uh, I I was all I was all in the research mode after watching it, but uh, I did I did go back through because I was really curious then because they were like, 
I was the, the that was one of the things that made me the most curious was they kept talking about the note, like how it referred to fans and how it changed at the end, and, blah, and I was like. Read the note. Read me the note. I want, now you got me like totally intrigued. Like, what is it? What are you? What are they saying? And they never did. So like afterwards, I like just googled it, and you can you can read it. But uh, nice. it's yeah, it's kind of a, it's a weird note. And I'll give them that. It's uh... <laughs> <laughs> oh, so yeah. so I, okay. I I haven't I haven't I did read um, a biography of Kurt Cobain, and this is a uh, um, called Heavier Than Heaven, and this is interesting because I. So our friend Andy, like he's big on rock biographies. So I read this biography, I loved it, and I was like, I was like, oh man, Andy, you should read Heavier Than Heaven. You totally like it. He's like, nope. And I was like, why? He's like, that was with, that was. There's only two kinds of information out there on Kurt Cobain: the kinds that have Courtney's approval and the kinds that don't. And that's one that has Courtney's approval. So I'm not going near that thing with a ten foot stick. And he's like, uh, which uh, he, he's a big he's a big uh, Courtney killed Kurt Cobain guy. But um, but it was it was an interesting point that he was he was like he was like yeah anything that like if you want Courtney to be involved at all or give any quotes like she has to sign off on uh, on everything to do with the project or whatever. Um, so he doesn't trust anything that has a Courtney Courtney quote in it. Um, interestingly, I, I did I found out that uh, Courtney Love actually sent cease and desist letters to every movie theater that played this uh, played this movie soaked in bleach. Uh, saying that she was going to see him for showing this movie, but she didn't actually do it. She's just being crazy. Sure, I guess I could kind of see that if if somebody was like, "Yeah, we're going to put out a documentary about how you killed your husband." <laughs> if if the fact was that he did commit suicide, and, and you know that was a horrific event to begin with, and then you're going to portray me as a murderer and try and you know express a conspiracy theory about it, that would piss me off. I mean, I, I yeah. certainly wouldn't do anything about it, but because I don't have yeah, millions I mean, of dollars and a lawyer, but definitely have to admit though that, that she's a weirdo, and she and like she definitely did nothing to like settle these rumors by her completely bizarre, <laughs> bizarre yeah. behavior, like during, after, like directly. Yeah. At, I mean, even I, I mean, I remember you know when when it first happened, like how weird she was being and stuff like that, and seeing that. Any big fans of Nirvana back in the day, they hate her. They absolutely hate Courtney Love. Sure, I think she's a whack job, and she certainly might have... You know, if uh, if there's any argument that she was involved in his death, maybe because she drove him nuts and made him want to kill himself, because you know that, that would be hard to be married to Courtney Love. I don't think it goes any, <laughs> Hold any on, deeper than that. Send your cease and desist letters, too. <laughs> but... You know what's actually really funny about the... I don't know if you've uh, gone on the internet IMDb about about this movie, but if you look at the reviews, like the, the user reviews, they're almost all either 10s or they're 1s. There's like mm-hmm. nothing in between. I, I could see that. Yes, I saw that on, on Metacritic, um, this movie has an exactly 50%, and almost all the reviews are <laughs> like ones or tens. positive. And those are like from critics, you know, they're either super positive or super negative. Sure. Yeah, really, I would think from all critics, even if I was like, if I was like, Tom Garrett's the man, Courtney, or Grant. Kurt, 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 Tom, he, oh, is it Tom Grant? Grant? Tom Grant, sorry. Yes. Sorry about that. Tom Grant's the man, and, and, and Courtney murdered, you know, Kurt. I'd still, as a, as a critic, be like, seven. Just because <laughs> you, you made such a crappy documentary, and technically it's so sloppy and horrible. I gotta take away three stars from that, but it's a great message, so you get the other seven, you know. <laughs> right. Um, like one one coup that this documentary definitely does that you have to give a props for, though, is that I think at least is that spoilers, I guess, if we haven't spoiled it already, is that you know, like the very end, they like they you know the the chief of police in Seattle says, yeah, this should be if I was in charge, I would reopen this investigation. That's like there. That was like the money shot. You had to you imagine if you were the documentary filmmaker and they said that you'd be like, yeah, got it. Yeah. Done. The documentary's ready. Yeah. I, I have to say that was out of anything else. That was the only thing that I was like, oh, maybe you know, maybe there's more to it because the other thing that sucks and like, especially from Tom's point of view or and the directors and anybody else that buys the, like the thing the police had that we didn't have. They did actually see the autopsy report. They did actually have all the photos. They were actually on the crime scene, you know. So there, there were things that 
again, not saying like those things would be impossible to fake, but if, if they were fake, they were most likely faked by a group, a conspiracy of junkies. And, and you know, those things, you know, if you gave a Navy SEAL the duty to go kill, you know, some junkie, he could probably pull that shit off, no problem, make it look like an accident, no one would be the wiser. But if you were like, yeah, we're going to take, like, these five ultra junkies and try and have them pull off a crime scene and, and suicide where they actually, like, hold the gun at the correct angle and they actually, like, you know, make sure that it's it's this way. And plus, like, why wouldn't you just OD the heck out of the guy? You know, if you were if that was going to be your plan was to kill him, just OD him and then be like, oh, you just OD'd. You know, there's, there's so much less evidence and things to take care of. And there are just so many different... And again... I guess maybe you wouldn't think of that because you're a strung out junkie, so things don't make as much sense. But again, this was the tried, this was the tried room, man. Now they gotta, they gotta take it to the next level. <laughs> that's, that's right. That's right. I'm just saying, like it's, and I mean that's that's just a circumstantial thing. For my own thought process, would be like, yeah, if if a bunch of junkies tried to pull this off, they would fail, or at least, yeah, you know, somebody would do more than have a, a shell casing on the wrong side of the body. You know, some. Than some, something more than that, um, especially because yeah, and they, it, I guess that was the other big we never touched on the other big piece of evidence, and that one made me think about it a lot a, a bit was you know the shell casings on the wrong side that is pretty important and an actual fact. Um, yeah, I mean I don't know, I've I've shot guns a bit in my life when I was young. I shot you know shotguns quite a bit, and there's a tremendous amount of force when you shoot a shotgun. Um, you know, the fact that a shell casing could, either the gun could turn, you know, if, especially if you tried to shoot a shotgun sitting down, I tried to think about that, like, it seems like a very difficult process, and there would certainly be a ton of force and momentum in that, so, you know, I mean, like, if somebody wanted to push that point a long way, I, I would love to see that more explored heavier. That would be a reason to reopen the case to, for me. But do I believe that in that amount of force that happens that quickly the gun could turn or the shell casing could come out or bounce off his wrist while he's holding the shotgun at that weird angle and end up in a place you didn't expect. Yeah, that seems totally probable. I mean, it's definitely worth investigating, though, because, I mean, that is a real fact that should have been explained. Yeah. No, it definitely yeah. is. I mean, like, like again, it's just, I just think there's something there, that's all. And, and who knows, like, all, all, all you really have is a little bit of a mystery, and then a whole lot of motive is all you really got. <laughs> do you think there's, like, for the whole lot of motive, do you think it's just because, like, like, the money from the divorce or just, like, the divorce in general or, like, what would be, like... Honestly, like, if you truly feel that Courtney Love did this, like, she'd have to be, like, kind of narcissistic, you know, controlling, sociopath, even psychopath, whatever. I don't know what you want to call her, but, like... She's gonna want to control Kurt Cobain, and I and I have a feeling that she did kind of control him. And as soon as he realized that she was doing it or whatever, he, and he wanted to get out, I know this is this is a lot of ifs and whatevers, but I just think that like if she was losing control of Kurt Cobain and losing control of all that money, and like I think I think that would have pissed her off enough to do this because she probably thinks that she was right, and because like true narcissists don't think they're wrong. I mean, no matter what. So like, I, like again, like it, it doesn't even matter. I mean, you could think logically about it about money, but I don't think it has to do entirely about money. I think because like you could tell the way she's controlled like the Nirvana like anthology, like all their songs and everything. Like cause she has had much a lot of control over that for the throughout the years. Like I know there's been like articles and things I've read about how she doesn't want things released and stuff like that. Very controlling. Yeah, yeah, I'll give you that. And like um, and, and again, like you know. If they, if their goal is to just to solidify in my mind that that Courtney Love is a weirdo, then yeah, done. Check. They 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 got that. I mean, like, granted, this is well, that was the big. But... I have I I have, you know I have a big. That's my one issue with this whole thing because he's like, oh, she's always so weird and everything, and like she's who knows how who she is really because she's freaking right. drunk. She's all a lot of right. I mean, shit all the time. Yeah, maybe when she's sober, she's really pleasant. I, I know you have no idea. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> <You> not <don't> know. <laughs> right. It's impossible to tell. 
Um, so you guys have had a lot of you guys have been beefing a little bit about the truth of this documentary. I think the only way to decide is like, are either of you by chance wearing a T-shirt from a former Nirvana <laughs> member? If if so, I'm going to declare that person the winner of this this conversation. I don't know. Right. <laughs> the, oh my gosh. That. Oh look at that! Look at that broken leg tour from Foo Fighters. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> All right. Any any um, closing <laughs> thoughts on um, Soaked in Bleach? I thought it, I thought it was a. And I'm going to ask that question and totally interrupt and keep going. Um, I thought it was a a worthwhile documentary to watch because it certainly provoked a lot of good conversation in our in us. So. Good choice, I think. Yeah, yeah, I would, yeah. I would pass on this one. <laughs> it's pretty clear. Yep. But yeah. <laughs> but I'm glad we uh, I mean, discussed it, Greg. Go ahead. I guess my, I guess my, the only thing for me was this, this like I was just kind of emotional for me just because like I remember when this happened. I was in high school. I was very, I was probably what we were sophomores or something at the time. Yeah, I remember. I remember who told me Kurt Cobain. I, Jim Withington. I remember who I was with when I was told who Kirk O'Brien died. I was with Jim Withington. Actually. Ah, oh, yeah. Shout out, shout out to Jim Withington. Yeah. Oh, there it is. It's a big shout out. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I remember. I, I remember the, like it was a big deal, and I remember thinking, even back then, there was kind of a mystery about it, a little mystery. And now this just comes out. It's just kind of, it's kind of upsetting when someone, like, kind of important to me, in my formidable years, I would like to know. Exactly what happened to him? I would, but that's. I mean, that's my. That's that, that's just an emotion. That's just emotions talking there. So. Sure. sure, but that's cool. Um, so do you guys both think there's uh, enough there to at least like? I guess there's a two part question. One, do you think there's enough there to reopen the case? And, and two, do you think Courtney Love actually had anything to do with the death of Kurt Cobain? Um, I'll say yes. I'd, I'd like to see the the investigation reopen just to get a you know get peace of mind about it all. But uh, no, I don't really think Courtney Love probably had anything to do with it. But I'm, I guess I'm open to the possibility. It's possible. But my leanings would be no. How about you, Greg? Well, I definitely I definitely feel it should be reopened. They should look into it. Um, but unfortunately, like what Jonathan did say, like it'd be, I'd be very surprised if Courtney Love pulled this off. It'd be very surprising if a, a true junkie <laughs> actually did something like this. Right, right. But, yeah, but it again, it it possible. I guess it'd be a possibility. Right. Um, it was kind of fun too to see the totally uh, side piece, but to see on like the MTV News. It reminded me like the clips around TV news that they're showing. Remember when MTV was like. Like consider themselves a serious like news yeah, organization totally. about like musical yeah, Kurt stuff. Yeah, Kurt Loader, heck yeah. <laughs> yeah, heck yeah, yeah that, that was, was awesome. Like, considering there's something, man, they were like they were taking themselves real seriously. Holy like, yeah. cow! Right, I miss that old MTV where they actually play like music videos and, right. and yeah, like music news and I don't know. I, do I, they I like still make it. music videos? I think so. They do, TV. but I think they just go to YouTube now, right? All right. I don't know. <laughs> All right. How many stars? Bro, judge your stars, brothers. Do we do half stars or just sure? Yeah. Stars? Oh yeah. No, you can do half. You can do quarters yeah. if you want. I don't, I don't think we've ever done that before, but right. Eights are out though. Definitely no eights. <laughs> <laughs> right, well, I'll go uh, three and a quarter. Three and a quarter stars. <laughs> I definitely was. De I was definitely entertained by it, but like, 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 there were definitely flaws. In, in, I mean, the, the story itself was very interesting to me, and I, I actually really liked finding like the information out. You know, the pet, like the last few days of his life, that kind of thing. But right. like the documentary, was, like the format of it was no good in my personal opinion. Indeed, I'm, I'm pretty close to my thoughts. I was thinking uh, three stars, exactly between one and five. You know, it was, it was, I'm, I'm, I'm glad I got the information. Didn't like how it just. Started. Jonathan, all right, I'm, going for, I'm gonna go pretty harsh on this one. I'm gonna give it a one and a half. It wasn't the bottom of the barrel. There, there were things that there were like two good moments in there, maybe three of like when they, when they actually like you know threw out a couple things like the one the money shot they got with the chief of police, the ex chief of police. That was actually like pretty cool that they they were able to pull that into the documentary. Pretty much hated the rest of it, so it gets a half star for that. 
and, and the one for you know existing because I support all documentaries. <laughs> so is is the one the lowest you could possibly get? I I think a zero is a <laughs> possible okay, score. Okay, all right. So it's not a zero. It's a one that they have. Got it. A zero yeah. would be like a murder film of his family being killed or something. Like that. <laughs> right? Yeah. They... <laughs> Not very likely. Um, all right, so Greg, we're at the part of the show where, much to Jonathan's chagrin, I uh, recommend a random something that I'm enjoying. Really nothing to do with documentaries, but I'm going to do it because I do it every week. So here you go. I'm going to recommend the Golden State Warriors to you guys. Are you guys <laughs> following the, gold, the NBA team, the Golden State Warriors at all? No. Um, no, not, no, not at all. Okay, you both live in NBA towns that have NBA teams. I recommend you go to your schedule, look at with the, the Golden State Warriors are coming, and go to that game because prior to this season, the uh, best winning streak was 15-0 and to start. The uh, Golden State Warriors are currently 23-0, and and uh, they are ridiculously awesome. They're, they're like redefining the game of basketball. This is a team that's going to be talked about 20 years down the line. There's a lot of talk that they're going to they're gonna beat the 72-game uh uh, wins of the uh, of the Chicago Bulls. So, yeah. There you go. Um, so there's one definitely one of the best teams of all time, and uh, one definitely... of the best teams of all time. I don't know about that. That was yeah, definitely the uh, best team of all time, wasn't that? No, I'm talking Is about the Warriors. They're, they're, they're definitely one. The Warriors are are in the conversation for one of the best oh, teams of all. Gotcha. Time. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, wow. Well, I gotta say, Tyler. I, I, Especially since we had Greg on as guest host, I'm really disappointed by your your <laughs> other things. Because normally your other thing is a lot like like a different podcast, or typically right. it's a different podcast. Which and then plus they're always like so intriguing. Like you know, I'm always like, oh man, there's something I never would have found out about had Tyler not just told me about it, and it's really intriguing. And now like you know, now it's like, oh well, one, I, I probably. I guess it is probably good because I had no idea that there was a streak going on in basketball right now. That's how much I watched. <laughs> Neither sports. did I. So, yeah, um, but yeah. No, so you have so zero interest in the fact that like one of the best teams. I, I that's why I picked it because I was like these two guys probably have no idea that like one of the best like the best accomplishments in the history of basketball is happening right now. I got to call this out to these guys. And let them know. No interest. No care. No. <laughs> Not really. Sorry. I I mean, it sounds cool, I guess, but it, for maybe cool for someone else, I guess. Right. Well, the the Steph Curry, the the point guard of the Warriors, is like redefining the point guard position. He's like shoots crazy three pointers, like it, it, and it's really really fun to watch because he like the dude will be up in his face and he's way far away from the three point line. He just throws it up and it goes in every time. He's like the best shooter in the history of basketball for sure. Maybe really? Pretty much no debate that he's the best shooter. All right. Wow. Take that aside. Cool. Take that and put it how, aside. Old, how old is this guy? Um, I want to say, kind of guessing, but I want to say it's like maybe his fourth season, fifth season. Okay. So he's probably like, so he's got probably some like time, late he's got 20s. some time left. Okay. Yeah. He's on the juice, right. isn't he? <laughs> I don't know, it's pretty, he's a pretty cool guy. All right, three documentaries. These documentaries, we're picking, Greg, this is the part of the show where we pick what we're going to be talking about next week. Okay. I lay out three documentaries, and Jonathan picks um, which one he wants to watch. He can take your input if he wants. It's up to him, though. Sure. All right. Here. So the first Wait. one is um, is called Call Me Lucky. It's about a comedian named Barry Crimmins. And I heard this guy on a, doc, on a podcast recently, and he talked about he was, like, molested as a child. And in the early days of the Internet, like in the 90s, he uh, stumbled upon and discovered, like, a bunch of, like, child molesters, like, hanging out in AOL chat rooms, and no one was doing anything about it. And he was like, huh, this should be illegal, but it was, like, not illegal at all to, like, pass around child pornography on the Internet. And uh, so he, like, went into action and, like, worked to get that to be made illegal. And uh, I'm not sure how much of the documentary focuses on that aspect because it says this film chronicles the varied career of bombastic comic and social critic Barry Crimmins and the painful past that inspired his peaceful activism. But anyway, that's that one. These are all three documentaries about people who some kind of small discovery that changed the world in some way. So he changed the world by discovering that there's pedophiles <laughs> in the old border. Pedophiles online, gotcha. Yes. 
All right, um, number two, Dinosaur 13. Documentarian Todd Miller chronicles the legal battles that followed the historic 1990 discovery of the first complete Trinosaurus Rex. It's apparently uh, first, first, maybe, I don't know. The is, that, is that it? Yeah, yeah that's, um, that's Sue, right? Yeah, yeah. Good, good get. Way that's to in, have that's a kid in Chicago. That, I've, I've seen yeah. it. Oh, nice. I've, I've, that's funny. I've seen films on what you've actually seen. High five. <laughs> well done. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so another discovery that changed our understanding of the world, at least, a little bit. Do you, do you know the name of the paleontologist who discovered that? Her name is Sue. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't I know. Like yeah. 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 All right. So, all right. So, uh, so it's about the uh, the legal battle after the discovery of that. Yeah. Yeah. Apparently, a bunch of people were pissed about the ramifications of what that discovery. Oh, it's a it's a big deal. There's no doubt about it. It was a big deal. Oh. All right. All right. Okay. Now I'm a little right. more intrigued. Number three is if you build it, and this is a little bit smaller of a of a of a happening, but you know, changing the world in a smaller way. So this is a um, a basically a, a what do you call it? A, like a like a wood shop kind of teacher in rural North Carolina who has a revolutionary uh, plan to train people. Uh, here's the. Oh, let me just read the description because I'm bombing this. Yeah. Hoping to renew the economic health of a rural North Carolina town. A designer and architect together create a new kind of high school design class. It's about these low-income kids who like get way into design and possibly hmm. in the the basically the, the reviews all say this is like a possible way to this this is like the best example of how to help people in low-income situations by giving them skills to like shape the future. Basically, so there you go. Those are your three documentaries. We've got Call Me Lucky, uh, Dinosaur 13, and If You Build It. What do you want to do, Jonathan? Feel free to phone a friend in Greg. If you Ooh, I think I'm going to have to phone a, fr a friend because these all actually sound interesting to me. Greg, what, what, do, you, what do you think? What are your thoughts? Well, um, the funny thing is I've actually seen a trailer for Dinosaur 13. So, Ooh. like, I don't know if that means it's just a higher-end documentary. I had more money behind it, more backing it. But... I know that third one actually sounded pretty interesting as well about the design school. It, all right, it did, darn. Well, that didn't help me too much, but at least, <laughs> all right. So you're out, <laughs> me lucky. You're, you're toast. Not worth it. Um, <laughs> I just watched a documentary called Slingshot, which was kind of like, a, which if you're if you guys are bored and want to watch a cool documentary, it's uh, it's about the guy that invented the uh, the Segway. Who is actually like really interesting guy, and, and he's working on some other even like that was just kind of like a footnote in his career. He's invented all kinds of crazy stuff, including if you've gone to the doctor pretty much ever in our lifetimes, you, you've used or you know been helped by things he's invented. Anyway, side note, check it out; it's really cool. But I think I'm gonna go with uh, yeah. If you build it, I'm curious to see what the best way to help uh, you know people uh, make it in. American society is through education. Cool. All right. If you build it, we will be checking that out next week. Join us for that. In the meantime, you can email us at feedback at documentaryreviewpodcast.com. Please go over to iTunes, leave a review. Hey, I'm going to say, too, if you're <laughs> if you're an iTunes listener, boy, it's been a, ro a roller coaster of a ride for you because <laughs> for about three weeks, no, more than that, five weeks we didn't. <laughs> I didn't post a, a podcast on there because our website was down and I couldn't post them. Uh, but since then, I've been posting one a day. So you were like, is this podcast dead? And now you're getting one a day. So I just want to thank you for the wild ride that I've put you on and uh, ask you to go leave a review. All right. Thank you so much for going, joining us, Greg. We appreciate you. You're welcome back anytime. And, uh, I, yeah, and, my pleasure. No, the pleasure is ours. Don't Absolutely. <laughs> we, we all bow to Greg Johnson. Thank you, sir. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for listening. We will You're talk welcome. to you next time. This is PT. Keep it real. This is Jonathan. We'll see you next week.